one 800 585 I don't understand why I have to earn salvation. 1-800-585-9396. What's stopping? Why do I need to confess my sins to a priest? What's stopping you? you, you, you. This is Call to Communion with Dr. David Anders on the EWTN Global Catholic Radio Network. Happy Tuesday to you. It is once again called to communion here on EWTN, the program for our non-Catholic brothers and sisters. And we are glad that you could join us today. Here's our phone number, 1-800-585-9396. 1-800-585-9396. Outside the U.S. and Canada, your number is 1-205-271-2985. We also have a, a groovy email address, and that is uh, ctc at ewtn.com. I just got the funny eye there from uh, Dr. David Anders. We were having a conversation yesterday about these colloquialisms and how they change from generation to generation. My yes. wife was talking about the stuff that my teenagers say, yes. and I turned to her and I said, but you know, there really were people once upon a time who used the word groovy. <laughs> <laughs> and, and and you're talking to one of them right now. Here I am. It's a it's a one man crusade to bring back the word groovy. Groovy, dude. Because it just is. Hey, I want to thank uh, uh, the, the people that work on this program because uh, it's it, it's a lot of hard work to get this program on the air each and every day. And I'm very appreciative to uh, our own uh, Rich Jesse, our producer, Magic Matt Kabinsky, and of course uh, Dr. David Anders. Well, in the words of my, we got this, and it's all good. Well, <laughs> like that a lot. Here's our phone number again, 1-800-585-9396. Do you have a question about the Catholic faith? Is there something about the Catholic faith that perhaps perplexes you? You don't understand or maybe that you really disagree with perhaps even vehemently? Well, give us a call. You may be uh, laboring under a misconception that's been uh, festering there for many, many years, right, David? Well, I know I was, Yeah. to be sure. I mean, I spent 30 years thinking that the Catholic Church was the whore of Babylon, not to put matters too succinctly, and was pretty dead set on tearing her to pieces. Not to give anything away here on the show, but it's not the whore of Babylon. <laughs> not the whore of Babylon, That's, exactly. That spoiler, is, spoiler. Yeah, no kidding. And, uh, yeah, and so after 10 or 15 years of beating my head into piles of theology books, I woke up one day and realized I was in the wrong church. That was disconcerting, to say the least. Awkward. Awkward. So but, whatever your objection is, I probably had it. Had so there you go. Get that he's pounded out of my skull. He's been where you possibly are. One 585 9396 One 585 9396 While we're getting these calls screened, I want to uh, go through a, a quick email, and this is actually very timely. This is from Katie in Virginia, and she says, "Do we have an obligation to accept and believe every line in a papal encyclical?" I speak particularly of scientific conclusions about the human impact on climate and the, prud <laughs> the prudence of the encyclical's prescriptions when it comes to government action and the consequences thereof when it comes to economic impact and impact on human freedom and flourishing that can be affected by economic and government policy. Uh, clearly, she's talking here about the Pope's she's new read the encyclical. encyclical right. she, she goes on to say, I think particularly of Aquinas and his flawed understanding of ensoulment and the Immaculate Conception. But he wasn't Pope, and his not in the form of an encyclical. Please help me understand what we must assent to. Thanks again, Katie in Virginia. Yeah, thank you so much. I really appreciate it. It's a great question. Um, we have to assent. We have to give the assent of faith been proclaimed as a dogma, either by the extraordinary magisterium of the Church in a in an infallible pronouncement from the Pope, or from uh, a dogmatic teaching from an ecumenical council, or that which has been proclaimed by the universal uh, magisterium of the Church, always, everywhere, and by everyone believed as a part of the Catholic faith. Well, okay. To those things, we have to give the assent of faith. When the when the when the bishops, together with the Pope, intend to teach Catholic doctrine, but they fall short of actually proclaiming something as a dogma, exercising the charism of infallibility, but they do participate in the in the normal. Uh, uh, ordinary teaching office of the church, uh, those those doctrines proclaimed in that less solemn way call forth our uh, religious submission and mi of mind and will, but not for the assent of divine faith. So in other words, if the if the pope or the bishops, I mean they're the official spokespeople for the Catholic faith. If they if they take a position 
on, uh, on, on morals or theology, even if it falls short of a dogma, we shouldn't be in the position of standing up and saying, that's not right, and that's not the way I read the text. No, they, they have the job of proclaiming the faith, and so we, sub we, we uh, submit to that religious submission of mind and will. That's the way the Code of Canon Law reads. Um, and, uh, and the purview of the magisterium is specifically on uh, matters of faith and morals. And that includes matters that relate to uh, uh, social morality, social justice, so things that pertain to human society. Mm -hmm. um, and so when they teach uh, on those topics, that's where they have uh, that's where they have the purview. That's where they have the commission from Christ to teach the faith. Anything that pertains to the salvation of man or to the rights of man, his uh, it, as well as his uh, social and political rights, because those are moral issues as well. We have to uh, to submit and assent to those doctrines as they're proclaimed by the magisterium. We don't, uh, the magisterium doesn't have any particular expertise on matters of scientific fact, except insofar as they pertain to, to faith and morals. So, for mm -hmm. instance, Pope Pius XII, addressing the question of human origins, uh, said uh, there's a lot of leeway, for instance, in the study of human origins, but there are places where those subjects do impinge on the doctrines of the faith, namely um, the... Uh, uh, original sin and original justice and uh, and the ensoulment, uh, God creating the soul and uh, infusing it directly into the human person. Those are things that the Catholic faith ha ha does have something to say about, but outside of that, there's a lot of leeway. Mm -hmm. So with respect to the current encyclical on the environment, I think it's really a wonderful document. And, and what the Pope has done is taken the question of the environment and placed it smack dab in the middle of the tradition of Catholic social teaching. And he said, look, you have to look at the environment uh, the environment is our common home. The, the world is our common patrimony. We have, to, we have to think about the environment. We have to think about the planet in terms of Catholic social teaching, such as the universal destination of goods, the <coughs> dignity of man, the principle of the common good. These kinds of issues uh, have to be brought to bear when thinking about the environment. So he does relate the questions of environmentalism to, to Catholic theology and social doctrine, then he says, okay, now in light of what the general scientific consensus is, here are some moral, uh, uh, moral principles that would flow from that. But, of course, the scientific facts themselves are out, outside the purview of the magisterium. So, yeah, and there's room for discussion and debate on the prudential application of these principles because the, the facts could change. We may get more data and discover different things. So that's not within the purview of the magisterium. Did he not, did the Holy Father not address this, not just to all Catholics, but to all people? He addressed it to all people, he did. Yeah. Yeah, he, so. he's, he really wants to, to engage the world in the dialogue about, okay, um, given <clears throat> that this is what the scientific community says is the, are the empirical facts, Yeah. Given that that premise, what then would be the moral implications? Okay, fair enough. Hope that is uh, helpful for you, and it's a very timely question. Love getting all these questions, uh, whether they're uh, via email or uh, people checking us out on YouTube. Sometimes they will put in uh, a question, and uh, Jeff Burson will uh, send that to us. We're glad to answer those as well. Primarily, though, it's the telephone, and uh, we're waiting for your call, 1-800-585-9396. 1-800-585-9396. If you're calling from outside the U.S. and Canada, your number is 1-205-271-2985. And if you're calling from outside the U.S. and Canada, we'll pop you up to the head of the line. I promise. When we come back from our break, we'll talk with Mike and uh, Suzanne, and hopefully you as well, at 585-9396. 11 past. This is Call to Communion on EWTN. Sharing the fullness of the Catholic faith. 1-800-585-9396. This is Call to Communion with Dr. David Anders on the EWTN Global Catholic Radio Network. We live with that we are in control. One Minute Monk, Abbot Placid Solari of Belmont Abbey. Yet, how much of life actually is under our control? We need to develop our talents and make prudent preparations for the future, but how many times have our plans been sidetracked by forces outside our control? Sometimes, unexpected changes have even opened up new opportunities. In his rule, St. Benedict talks about the beauty and purpose of monastic life. The rule is very successful at separating the monks who live according to its from the illusion of control, giving us a peaceful confidence in God's provident care. 
For more information on the rule of St. Benedict or Belmont Abbey, visit OneMinuteMonk.com. O-N-E, MinuteMonk.com. Preparation for our last act of letting go of control when we will have to commend our life trustingly into the Father's hands and death. What's stopping you, you, you from becoming a Catholic? This is Call to Communion with Dr. David Andrews. 1-800-585-9396. Welcome back. It's uh, 12 minutes after the hour. This is indeed Call to Communion here on EWTN. We have one line open for you, 1-800-585-9396. Let's go right now to Maya in Toledo and listening there on uh, local radio. Hello, Maya. What's your question today? Hi, thanks for taking my call. Sure. Um, I'm Catholic, I'm a convert, uh, and my husband has some very close family friends that um, are part of the State of the Contest movement, that they, uh, this uh, Society of St. Pius X. And basically, I try, they, they will, um, when we talk to them, they'll try to gently bring up their position and say they want to, you know, basically enlighten us and so on. I've tried to do some internet searching on the topic, and it ends up getting off into the weeds very quickly. Yes, it does. Um, yeah. And basic, I found a really great uh, blog from a theologian last night that was funny, titled uh, State of Contism, A Great Conspiracy to Waste Time. Um, <laughs> but <laughs> I thought that was very helpful. Um, essentially, I would just avoid the topic altogether with them, although they bring it up, and they're very close, very dear friends. And so I'm asking, or I'm calling to see if you have any good resources for me that might be a bit more understandable. I, I'm pretty sure that I'm not, it's not like I'm going to get anywhere with them. They get to be kind of circular arguments. <laughs> and I'm really just not kind of sure what to say or to how to respond to um, things when they say like, Pope John Paul II was a horrible pope and all these things. Right. You know, sure. she's, she's bringing up a very good point. Uh, sometimes people uh, in a, a cult or a sect or, a, you know, it seems like that's all they can talk about. They can't talk about the weather. They can't talk about sports or music or anything else. They just want to keep hammering on this one thing. Yeah, it's true. That's that's kind of how they define themselves against the wider culture. So I, I have a couple ideas. First of all, uh, a great resource is uh, Father Zulsdorf's blog. And he just goes by the Internet handle Father Z. And uh, yes. Father Z yeah. extensively on the SSPX and then also about Citizen. Because they're not the same. I mean, the SSPX are not technically set of incantists, all right. But uh, but the the kind of ultra traditionalists and schismatic uh, far right Catholics that Father Z is a great resource for that, and you can just uh, just peruse his blot of really helpful information. Um, the way I usually uh, confront this issue when it's brought up to me is I like to do it in the words of of Saint Augustine of Hippo. You know, Saint Augustine was confronted by various puritanical sects in the 4th century, in particular by the Donatists, and they held themselves out as being, you know, the one pure church that hadn't that hadn't caved to the pressures of the age and so forth, yeah. and they thought of themselves as the apostolic uh, community. And, uh, and St. Augustine said, well, you guys are nuts because the verdict of the whole world is conclusive. That was his language. The verdict of the whole world is conclusive. You Done. guys can't possibly be the Catholic Church because you're just in North Africa. Yeah. And the word Catholic means universal. You look through the entire Christian world, and every bishopric on, bishopric on the planet recognizes the See of Rome and is in communion with Rome and with one another. That's the Catholic Church. For all its warts and failings of its members, mm -hmm. that's the church that Christ founded, and its very universality testifies against you. And so, you know, Christ made this pretty amazing promise that the gates of hell would never prevail against the church. And uh, when I look around the Catholic world today, it's not difficult to find a Catholic church. I mean, it really isn't. I mean, anywhere you are in the world, I can go up to anybody and say, where's the nearest Catholic church? Know what I mean, yeah. generally speaking, sure. and they can point it out to me. Yep. And I can find the bishop of that diocese and say, hey, by the way, do you know who the pope is? He's going, oh, yeah, I know. <laughs> He's this <laughs> fellow over there in Rome, you know, yeah. by the name of Pope Francis. And it doesn't matter. I mean, we can have debates all day long, historical debates, 
about the, the wisdom of, or prudence of any particular pope or papal action, or even a council or whatnot, and say, well, you know, they worded this well, or they worded this badly, or we think this was helpful or unhelpful. None of that really matters, ultimately, to the question of identifying where is the Catholic Church and where is the, ha the hierarchy. In the words of St. Augustine, the verdict of the whole world is conclusive. Sure. Right? And, uh, and so, essentially, what, what uh, far-right Catholics have done is set themselves up as the interpreter of sacred truth. They have, they have taken this job, appropriated the job that was given by Christ to the magisterium, and said, this is our job. Uh, and so they've become, in a sense, Protestants. Yeah. Wow. The principle of private interpretation. Um, and then, like you said, you can get lost in the weeds you start, you know, mm -hmm. digging down into historical details. And for that, I'd direct you to Father Z's work on the subject. Do check that out. Does that make sense, Maya? Absolutely. Thanks so much for that. I'll check that out. I appreciate you're, it. Thank you're you. most welcome. Have a great day. 17 after the hour, and we're going now to Jonathan in Oregon. Hey, Jonathan, what's your question today? John, hey, Jonathan, Jonathan in Oregon. Yes. Hey, hey, how are you today? Hello. Hey. Go right ahead. Yeah, um... I was interested in uh, clarifying for myself how the entire Catholic Church is one priest calling another priest father, and uh, the Pope's the great father, and uh, everybody's father, father. And it's uh, obvious from Scripture, Matthew 23, verse 9, that Jesus said to call no man father on earth who, when there is only one father who is in heaven. Sure. Yeah, I really appreciate the question. So do you think that when Jesus made this statement that he had in mind specifically the Catholic priesthood? I think he had in mind to, not to elevate men beyond this station, and to assume a posture that isn't uh, that, that they don't qualify for. That's a father. And, to call, and every, but every uh, admit, person that's admitted to the Catholic Church uh, is ultimately called father, and you know you're just giving it away. Uh, it, it, there's there's a, a holiness beyond the Pope, which is the only Father which is in heaven, and the Scripture is quite clear when Jesus said, "Call no man father." Yeah, I think it is absolutely very clear, and I think it's important for sacred Scripture to look at the context and ask yourself. The is Jesus addressing? What is the issue that he is raising? What is he intending to teach us? And that's why I asked you if you think that he has the Catholic priesthood in mind when he talks on this passage, and I don't see any evidence from the context that he does. Rather, I would read it in light of Jesus's uh, uh, teaching that recurs throughout the Gospels, that we're not to prefer anything to the honor of God, including our own biological father or mother or brothers and sisters. And you know, there are other passages like Luke chapter 14, verse 26, where Christ says, if anyone comes to me and does not hate his father or his mother, his wife, his children, his brothers, his sisters, and yes, even his own life, he cannot be my disciples. Now, I uh, reading it in light of the entire Bible, I think it's pretty clear that Jesus is not advocating hatred of one's parents. He's not advocating hatred of one's brothers and sisters. Uh, this is hyperbolic language that he uses to teach the more fundamental lesson that we're not to prefer anything to the honor of God. Does that mean, therefore, that it is wrong for me to address my biological parent as dad or papa or father? Um, the, the entire history of the Christian tradition would seem to suggest otherwise. Not only priests, of course, that we call father, we also call our biological, and Christ rules that out as well, then you'd be inconsistent. Um, we find other passages of sacred scripture where the title father is used of those that are in apostolic ministry. So St. Paul, for instance, addresses Timothy as his son. You are my son. He speaks to the Corinthians and say, I have become your father through the gospel. And so uh, the practice of the apostles themselves, as well as the unbroken tradition of the church, and I think reason, lead us to the conviction that this is not a prohibition, a universal prohibition on the use of the word pater. Uh, it's simply a moral exhortation that we not prefer uh, our own honor or anyone else's honor to that of God. Hope that's helpful for you, Jonathan. Here's our phone number. We have one line open right now, 1-800-585-9396. 1-800-585-9396. If you have a question about the Catholic faith or if there's something about the Catholics or you're thinking, man, they are way off mark, 
Well, let's talk about that. 1-800-585-9396. 21 past, almost 22. Let's go to uh, Suzanne in Big Spring, Texas. Hey, Suzanne, what's your question today? Suzanne in uh, Texas, are you there? Oh, hello. Hi yes, there. I am here. Very good. Uh-huh. Like, uh, the lady that called two callers ago. Um, my question is about uh, John chapter 6, verse 63. Because I want to be able to defend the Bread of Life discourse through Church of Christ or someone. Mm-hmm. And that, that verse right there... It is the spirit that gives life while the flesh is of no avail. And I have a New American Bible, and it has a note on there, but I'm not sure I understand exactly how that verse fits in with that entire teaching on the Eucharist. Oh, sure. Okay, so sometimes Protestants will point to this text and say, you see the question of Christ's uh, uh, literal presence, his bodily presence in the Eucharist, ruled out. Because John here says that the flesh avails for nothing. Well, if you applied that principle to the entire Gospel of John, it would rule out the principle. It would rule out the doctrine of the incarnation. Oh, because the the beginning of of the Gospel of John, John chapter one, the great truth that is proclaimed is that Christ, the Word of God, who was with God, who is God, has become flesh. The doctrine of the incarnation. He became flesh, dwelling among among us. Amen. Right? And that's something that's taught over throughout mm-hmm. the New Testament, that it is through the incarnation of the Son of God that we attain salvation. And so if you if you were to hold to that interpretation of John 6, that the flesh avails for nothing, you would have to hold that the flesh of Christ avails for nothing. That's not the teaching of the passage at all. Rather, we find multiple throughout the Gospel, John as well as the synoptics in St. Paul's letters, where the word flesh uh, can mean either flesh as in distinction from spirit, all right, um, and in St. Paul's writings, it can actually mean the flesh of fallen man that's inclined towards sin. All right. Now, obviously, Christ's flesh is not inclined towards sin. Um, and here he's not talking about the flesh of Christ at all. He's talking about the flesh of those who are listening to the, to the discourse that without the indwelling of the Spirit of God, that they lack the capacity to receive the, the Word of God. They lack the capacity to hear the words of life that Christ is giving. Mm-hmm. You know, Christ himself says that he teaches in parables so that, uh, those only, so that those who have ears to hear might hear, and the others don't hear. They don't understand yeah. um, that the Spirit of God has to come by and give them the ability to receive uh, the gospel with faith. All right, so that's really what he has in mind. He's not he's not denigrating the principle of flesh or the salvation of the flesh. The doctrine of the resurrection is part and part of tradition. It's part of the proclamation of the gospel that our bodies themselves, be because they're joined to the flesh of Christ, the incarnate Son of God, come for our salvation. There you go. Appreciate your call, there, Suzanne. It's uh, about uh, twenty five after the hour. We're going to take a a uh, quick break in here in, in just a moment. I want to remind you of our phone numbers. We do have one line open right now. 1-800-585-9396. 1-800-585-9396. If you have a question about the Catholic faith, uh, we are here for you. This is a program specifically for our non-Catholic brothers and sisters. We call it Call to Communion, and we do it Monday through th- Thursday at this hour here on EWTN. Great show coming up tonight on Mother Angelica Live Classics. We've been talking about this for a couple of days now. Tonight, Mother talks about suffering and how our faith relates us relates to how we handle it. You know, everybody suffers, right? Everybody. David suffers in his own life, right? Am I right? <laughs> You're correct. So, but, but how do we choose to deal with it? That's what sets us apart, I think. The, the Catholic doctrine on suffering is the, is the only tradition that I know of anywhere in the world that actually makes sense of our suffering, that makes it something that's not merely an evil to be avoided, but something that can become meaningful. It's always a mystery. Suffering is always a mystery. Yeah. But the Catholic faith teaches us that through this mystery that God ultimately brings about something good for our salvation and the salvation of the world. Jerry Usher today on the program Take Two with Jerry and Debbie was talking about a friend of ours, uh, Doug Pearson, who is actually in the final stage of his life. And he is dealing with his suffering in a very redemptive way. And it's a, it's a great example for all of us who are, are, are still trying to deal with losing our dear friend. Well, praise be to God. Yeah, absolutely. So check out what Mother has to say tonight, 8 p.m. Eastern, on EWTN Television. 
When we come back, we will talk with uh, Renee in Erie, Pennsylvania, David in Charleston, South Carolina, Mary in Washington State, and Barb in Michigan. All coming up next here on Call to Communion on EWTN. Stay with us. The EWTN Global Catholic Radio Network. By watching EWTN, by listening to EWTN, I'm not Roman Catholic, I'm Protestant, but I have been able to spit out my shame, my guilt. I feel like I'm healed now. I've been able to work in a pregnancy center. I pray at our Planned Parenthood. I've visited Hansville. I've been to the memorial for the unborn with my mother. I can't thank the Catholic Church enough. Next time on EW Live, founder of Hope and Purpose Ministries, Deacon Larry Oney offers his view on the status of race relations within the United States today. See how he recommends all Catholics promote a culture of understanding and healing. I'm on EWTN Live. This is Call to Communion with Dr. David Anders on the EWTN Global Catholic Radio Network. 1-800-585-9396. I honestly can't even picture my life without EWTN. You can get every need met between radio, television, internet. God bless you. Never let EWTN go by the wayside. If you have a comment, we'd love to hear from you too. Call 205-795-5773 or send us an email to radio at EWTN.com. Thank you very much for listening. God bless you. I am Father Thomas Loya, and this week on Light of the East on EWTN, the sacrament or mystery of holy matrimony in the Byzantine spirituality is not so much a covenant between a couple as it is an entrance of the couple into the life of the Holy Trinity and the life of the Church. There are other features as well that make this ritual distinctive. On EWTN, Sundays at 11.30 a.m. Eastern. What's stopping you from becoming a Catholic? This is Call to Communion with Dr. David Andrews. 1-800-585-9396. EWTN Radio, glad to be on over 300 radio stations in America, including uh, 88.5 FM in Antioch, Illinois, 1510 AM in Jackson, Michigan, and also 104.5 FM in El Dorado and Santa Fe, New Mexico. Glad to be everywhere that you are. And we're going to go now to, um, let's see here, looks like Cynthia in North Carolina, listening on FM 93.1. Hey, Cynthia, what's your question today? Hi, Cynthia. Hi. Um, I didn't think you were going to get to me. Um, I was very intrigued at the opening of the show. You said that you used to feel like the Catholic Church was the horror of That's right. I'm born and raised Catholic, and I love relevant radio because I'm learning so much I never learned about my faith. But when I read Revelation and they describe the horror of Babylon, I'm struggling with that. So I'd like to know how you overcame your belief. Sure. Thank you. I appreciate that a lot. Okay, so to understand why the... Um, <clears throat> why the Protestant churches made this charge against the Catholic Church, you have to go into Protestant theology. You have to understand what they think about the nature of the Church and the nature of salvation. And uh, they understood, the Reformers understood very well, um, that the Catholic Church had the strongest claim historically on being the Church that Christ founded. And so they had to come up with an unhistorical way of undercutting Catholicism. And so they they uh, uh, they seized on these apocalyptic passages of the New Testament, and, that, and then and then said, well, because the uh, the Roman Catholic Church doesn't affirm our peculiar understanding of justification or of the role of Scripture and tradition and so forth, therefore that's evidence for them there uh, being this whore of Babylon described in uh, in the writing of the New Testament. Well, what b began to unravel that for me is when. I uh, as a Protestant, when I began studying what Scripture actually taught and what the early actually believed on these core issues about how are we saved, how do we come to know God, how, how is the deposit of Christian faith to be found from century by century, what does it mean that we're justified by faith, all these kinds of uh, uh, really core Protestant questions. And I began to realize that the texts of Scripture themselves 
And the earliest Christians writing about the New Testament knew nothing of Protestantism. They knew nothing of faith alone. They knew nothing of justification by faith alone. They knew nothing of uh, uh, the principle of sola scriptura or scripture alone. Rather, they, they understood salvation as being mediated by the society that we call the Church, transmitted by sacramental graces like baptism and the Eucharist and uh, the sacrament of reconciliation. The government of the church had been entrusted to bishops who were the successors of the apostles, and what they taught, they did so with authority that was, that was uh, uh, verified and ratified by the Holy Spirit. They did so infallibly. Um, the unique role of the Bishop of Rome in early ch- Christian history, writers like St. Irenaeus of Lyon, the second century, saying it's a matter of utmost necessity that all the churches throughout the world agree with this church, namely Rome, on account of its preeminence and the, and the, uh, and the authority of the apostles it found. And so, you know, the evidence began to mount for the, uh, for the um, consistency of Catholic faith and practice with the teaching of the New Testament and the writers of the early Christian history. And then it's also just a simple matter historically to look at the foundation of the Church by Christ in the first century, walk it forward one generation at a time, and ask yourself the question, where was the Church in the first century? Where was the Church in the second century? Where was the Church in the third century? What character did it have? What doctrines did it promulgate? And to remember the promise of Jesus, that the gates of hell would never prevail against it. And, uh, and I began to see that, that uh, the Protestant Church wasn't the first church to, to uh, uh, lodge these accusations, of these apocalyptic charges against the Holy Roman See, um, and that, that heretics and schismatics throughout the ages have always said, have come up and said, you know, I alone have the truth. I alone have the truth, and I reject the Catholic Church because it's, you know, it's the horror of Babylon or it's or whatever, or, or the, end is, the, ends, the ends of the age have come upon us, and it's the last days, and, you know, I'm the prophet of truth, uh, you know, follow me. And all of these guys are has-beens. You know, they all start their church, they start their movement, uh, they draw uh, followers around them in some corner of the world, and then they fizzle out, and their own movement splinters off into, into multiple sides. You know, and the world is still here, and the Catholic Church is still here, teaching yeah. the one faith that Christ gave it unchanged and uh, and glorious throughout all the earth, just replete in saints and miracles and holiness of life. And so the, the claim of the Catholic Church to be the church that Christ founded, the proofs of the miracles, the proofs of the lives of the saints, um, the consistency of doctrine, and its consistency down through the ages together with the New Testament, um, uh, amount to me to an infallible proof of the divine origin of the Catholic faith. Cynthia, is that helpful for you? Yeah, it's pretty much the path I've taken. I just struggle with the description that's in Revelation and what to do with it. Um, Because the Catholic Church is a church that refers to, you know, the mother of the church. So I guess that's what I struggle with. It's the specific specific claim that the church is our mother? Well, just because that is part of the description that's in Revelation of the whore of Babylon— I've, it's, I've just started my day, so I don't have the scripture clear in my head right now. But I know that's one of the things I stumble on. Okay. Well, um, you know, I'm, I'm running a bit long on the call, and I want to come I back to that yeah. question. So I tell you what: why don't we? We'll dig up the scripture text. Why don't you call back tomorrow or later on in the week, and we'll go through it a little bit more carefully, if that'd be okay. all right. Okay, okay Cynthia. I appreciate it. Thank Thanks. you so Thank much. Thank you for your time. Most welcome. It's uh, 35 after. This is called a communion on EWTN. We go now to Barb in Michigan, listening on FM 88.3. Hey there, Barb. What's your question today? Yes, hi. Thank you. Um, my question is, in the Gospels, um, it says when Jesus died on the cross and he gave up his spirit and the curtain was torn in two and tombs of the saints were opened and saints came out of their tombs and walked around and i'm wondering is it known what happened to those saints and the people who came out of their tombs i i am not aware of a tradition regarding them there are mentions of this event in some of the early apocryphal literature of christianity but it's not part of the dogmatic teaching of the of the church um uh, since you raised the question I've been sitting here in my mind trying to run through the works of Eusebius, who's one of the earliest church historians, to yeah. try to remember if Eusebius talks about this or relays any traditions. I know that the, it does get brought up in some of the apocryphal traditions, uh, but then again, those are not you know binding on Catholics to believe. So uh, it is kind of an obscure passage, and we don't hear an awful lot about it. You know, I'm not particularly aware of what happened to these characters after. 
that it's uh it's you know it's part of the gospel tradition we're bound to believe it in terms of the fine details uh, i don't know that there's that much information yeah Mayor, uh, barb thank you so much for your call our phone number one five eight five nine three nine six one eight hundred five nine three nine six let's go to mary in washington state mary's listening to us on uh, sirius xm 130 hello mary what's your question today hi uh good morning Howdy. Here in the East Coast. Yeah. Um, my question is this. I'm, I was a cradle Catholic. Well, I am a cradle Catholic, but during my teenage years and early 20s, I left the church, and I'm, I'm the oldest of four kids, and I'm the only one who is, remained Catholic. Mm. I, went, I came back to my faith. Okay. And I love the church. I can't separate the church from Jesus in the sense, obviously I know people make mistakes, but the church is where I get Jesus, you know, body, blood, soul, and divinity. So I love the church. Recently, though, some friends of mine went to Rome, and they came back with a picture of a, a statue that was kind of where off obscure place, I guess, and, um, and it's of a female, and she's got the keys like you see um, St. Peter has. And they were talking about Pope Joan, that evidently, you know, she, you know, um, was Pope, and uh, then she gave birth, and they found out that she wasn't a man, and, and I'm thinking, you can't hoodwink the Holy Spirit. I mean, he'd know. And I just, you know, it's kind of rattled me a little bit, because if it wasn't true, why would this be in Rome? Why would this be in the Vatican, or the... I'm not sure. Well, do you know exactly where. where it was in Rome? I'm not sure exactly where. They they did they were there during uh during this last canonization, you know, so it's recent picture and it's somewhere um and this was I'm a this sure. was a statue or a Yes, it was a statue of okay, a woman so with the keys. Okay. Le- so let me uh let me jump in here if I could. I appreciate the question very much. Well, the set your mind at ease. There is no credible historical evidence for the existence of a Pope Joan. And there's certainly no contemporaneous evidence from the era in which she is alleged to have lived. Um, And uh, what we do find is some mentions of this legend several centuries after the fact. Um, And I don't find it all difficult to explain why. I mean, the detractors of the Church have, in every age, made up all kinds and falsehoods and stories in an attempt age. to discredit her. Yep, okay, yep. So that's uh, that's not untypical. Um, I mean, we find that the fact that the story has legs today is being used for polemical purposes in the same way in which it could have been constructed initially. Mm-hmm. Um, and it was not uncommon in, uh, in the 14th and 15th centuries to have all kinds of celebrations and satires and rituals and carnivals and so forth that took a lot of presuppositions about social roles and turned them on their heads just for the sake of comedy. I mean, so, you know, we find, we find carnival celebrations, you know, where, where the fool gets made king for a day, and this kind of thing was pretty common at the time. And uh, so it, it can either have been uh, polemical and malicious, or it could have just been, a, you know, comical and satire, but uh, there's absolutely no contemporaneous evidence for any kind of Pope Joan having time. I would refer you to a book that our friend Patrick Madrid wrote called Pope Fiction. And uh, don't confuse that with anything else. It's Pope Fiction by Patrick Madrid, and there's a whole chapter on the so-called Pope Joan right, exactly. goofiness that is that is out there. So don't worry about it, okay? Thank you so much for your call. When we come back from our break, we'll talk with Mike in Alpena, Michigan, also Renee in Erie, Pennsylvania, Tom in Pennsylvania as well, and hopefully you as one 800 585 Nine three nine six. Coming up on forty one past. This is Call to Communion on EWTN. Sharing the fullness of the Catholic. One 9396 This is Call to Communion with Dr. David Anders on the EWTN Global Catholic Radio Network. Father's prayer intention for the month of June is that immigrants and refugees may find welcome and respect in the countries to which they come. The mission intention 
is that the personal encounter with Jesus may arouse in many young people the desire to offer their own lives in priesthood and consecrated life. The EWTN Book of the Month for June is My Life with Mother Angelica by Sister Mary Raphael of the Poor Clares of Perpetual Adoration. In this heartwarming book, Sister Mary Raphael shares an intimate first-hand account of life in the monastery with Mother Angelica. It's available through the EWTN Religious Cat, EWTNRC.com, 24 hours a day, 7 days a week, or call 1-800-854-6316. What's stopping you from becoming a Catholic? This is Call to Communion with Dr. David Andrews. 1-800-585-9396. Back we are here at 42 past the hour. We go to Renee in Erie, Pennsylvania. And uh, Renee, how are you today? Hi, Renee. Hi. Hey, welcome to the show. What can I do for you? What's your question today? Well, I was wondering, like, why the Roman Catholic Church hasn't updated, like, the Protestant churches and the Episcopal Church that allows women to be priests and ministers, because certainly in the era where Jesus had the apostles go out, he couldn't have women go out and preach, because women wouldn't have been listened to, plus that would have been dangerous at those times. And with I love Pope Francis, and... I just don't understand, like, why the church doesn't look into that, because I'm sure there's, like, a lot of women, especially young women, maybe, you know, like, in their 20s and 30s or whatever, that may want to be a priest and maybe even go, like, and be, like, in a monastery, uh, you know, and like a, a priest that live in monasteries and pray all the time. Yeah, thank you. you. Renee, really, I really appreciate the question. It's a great question. It's a common one. Okay, so a couple things. First of all, when you talk about the monastic life, of course, women do participate very, very fully in in uh, the religious life and the contemplative life of the Church. And there are very many women in, in religious houses, religious foundations, who give themselves to our own Mother Angelica. Mother Angelica being a prime example, sure. exactly. And uh, and they do great good for the Church in that capacity. So um, they're certainly not deprived from the contemplative dimension of the Church. It's also pointing out that the Catholic Church understands two orders of priesthood. There is a priesthood that pertains to all the baptized faithful. It's called the baptismal priesthood. And every Christian who is baptized is a priest according to the baptismal priesthood. What is the office of a priest? What does a priest do? The main job of a priest is to offer sacrifice. And all Christians are called to do this, to lay down the sacrifice sacrifice of our lives, to give our prayers, our works, our joys, sufferings, and sorrows uh, to God, in thanksgiving or reparation to him. And that's something that all the Christian faithful share in, men and women alike. Now, there is also uh, a, another order of priesthood in the Catholic Church. It's called the ministerial priesthood, and it exists uh, at the service of the baptismal priesthood. It exists at the service of the baptismal priesthood. And the principal job of the ministerial priest is to effect the sacrifice of Christ in the holy sacrifice of the Mass, in the liturgy, in the Eucharist, when we come together to worship. The priest who does so stands in the place of Jesus. He is an icon of Christ. He represents Christ in the liturgical celebration. And Christ himself stands in relationship to the Church as that of a husband to a wife. That's the analogy that sacred scripture uses, as a husband to a wife. And so, but is figuring Christ, he's standing in representation of Christ to the liturgical community, it's necessary that as an icon he be male because he is representing the husband uh, vis-a-vis the wife that is the church. All right, this is all biblical teaching. Um, so that's something that is, uh, it's literally metaphysically impossible for a woman to represent a man in that capacity. All right, a woman is a woman, a man is a man. A woman no less than that of a man, she contributes different things faithful to the church and to the world. She has her own dignity. For instance, only a woman can be a mother. 
only a woman can be a my wife. As much as I want to, if I did, I could never be a mother no matter what I tried. All right? it's, it's, a, it's an impossibility for me to be a mother. I'm not metaphysically capable of it, not biologically capable of it. And a woman can't be a father and she can't be a husband, no matter what, no matter what. That's no slight on my dignity that I can't be a mother and it's no slight on her that she can't be a father or a husband. It's just the way we're made. Together, male and female, we equally share in the image of God. You know, the scriptures say that God made them male and female. In the image of God, he created them male and female. And so the popes have taught that the, the masculine dimension, the feminine dimension, are both essential to the church and to the human community. Um, again, it's no slight on the dignity of women. Now, you raise the question of the times in which Jesus lived. You know, Jesus uh, shows us over and over again in the Gospels not afraid to buck tradition. In fact, he was put to death for bucking tradition. That's right. And uh, and he he made an awful lot of claims that uh, that were rather astonishing to his contemporaries, for which they ultimately put him to death. Yeah. Uh, he of course did rely enormously on the ministry of women in the first century. They were the first witnesses to the resurrection. Christ could have chosen anybody to the, be the witnesses of his resurrection. He knew that the testimony of women. Uh, didn't have the legal status as the testimony of men, and yet he chose women to be the first witnesses. So the argument that Christ could not have chosen, that the Son of God who created the universe and sustains all things in being by his powerful word could not, if he chose, have made women apostles, um, I don't think that really with with the biblical tradition. And uh, the Catholic Church, of course, has looked into these questions extensively, and we find that for 2,000 years, every time the question has been raised, the Church has declared, we have no authority to change what Christ gave us. We have no authority to change what Christ gave us. This is a dogma of the faith given to us by Jesus, that the priesthood is to the the ministerial priesthood is to be reserved to men only. And Pope John Paul II, of course, wrote an encyclical on the topic. Uh, excuse me, an apostolic letter called Ordinatio Sacerdotalis, in which he said, "It is beyond dispute. The the question is settled. There will never be women priests in the Catholic Church." Appreciate your call, Renee. It was a good one. Uh, our phone number one eight hundred five eight five nine three nine six. We go to Tom in Pennsylvania, listening on AM 720. Hello, Tom. What's your question today? Hi. Uh, I, um, I hear you guys saying that Protestants believe in strict Calvinism. And I've been, I've been a pastor for 32 years, um, Pentecostal, and that just isn't true. It might be true sometimes you refer to the Presbyterian Church, but my experience is that... Uh, there's a middle there where we we believe in predestination, but we also believe that a person can make his own choices, and uh, so I find that to be not true. And you mentioned earlier that a woman asked about the Babylon, uh, the woman of Babylon, and I I am very uh, I I found people to be very uh, accepting of the Catholic Church. We have some different beliefs, but I have never heard that that you have been accused of that. Okay, Tom, I really appreciate uh, the, the call. And the last thing is this. I have noticed this, too, that many people that I know have left the Catholic Church. Uh, and the reason is that they don't believe in infant baptism. They believe that that you have a new life in Christ if you accept Him. And then baptism follows your strong experience of a new life in Christ. And for that reason, people are moving away from this idea of being saved at baptism as a child and toward uh, a new life through Christ. And then baptism being a, a, a very strong example of your faith in the Lord. Tom, I really appreciate the call. I want to clarify one thing. I have never made the claim that all Protestants are Calvinists. I myself was raised a Calvinist. Um, and I did my studies in, in Protestant seminary and then Protestant in graduate school I studied the history of Protestant theology and I'm keenly aware of the and denominational diversity within Protestantism. In my own 
Protestant seminary, Trinity Evangelical Divinity School, I had Baptist professors, I had Presbyterian professors, uh, I had, uh, you know, Evangelical Free professors, I had Charismatic and Pentecostal professors. I mean, it was kind of a smorgasbord, in fact. Yeah. I mean, you could take ecclesiology and get a completely different class, depending on which professor you signed up for, mm. uh, because there was so much theological diversity. Mm -hmm. And the Calvinists were just one school. So I'm very, very, very well aware of the dynamic that you speak about. I talk about Calvinism on this show a lot for two reasons. One, it's a tradition I know very well. And two, Calvin had a tremendous influence on Anglo-American even on the evolution of uh, the Pentecostal movement. That's something that a lot of Pentecostals don't know about. They think that they derive strictly from Wesley. Um, and uh, But if you go back and look at the New England theology and then the early holiness movement with guys like Asa Mahan and Charles Finney, you'll find that there's a Calvinist connection even there as well, and, uh, and the Puritans as well. So um, I talk about Calvinism because of its importance to the tradition, but I'm very well aware of the, of the theological diversity. Um, with respect to people leaving the Catholic faith uh, for the Baptist doctrine of believer's baptism, uh, yeah, to be sure, that's something that we begin to see happening in Zurich in the 1520s, and then, of course, the Baptist uh, denomination was founded in 1609 by John Smith, who was an ex-Anglican, um, and, uh, and there are people that, that found that compelling for one reason or another. Interestingly, it wasn't the theology of the early Protestant reformers. It wasn't the theology of Luther. It wasn't the theology of Calvin, nor of Cranmer, nor of Zwingli. Um, and it wasn't their theology because it's not taught in sacred scripture. Um, the, the doctrine that we encounter Christ in baptism is, uh, is, of course, a biblical doctrine. We read about it in Romans chapter 6, where Paul says that we die with Christ in baptism, that we might be raised again with him to new life. Or First Peter chapter 3, where we learn that baptism now saves you. Or St. Paul, again, in the letter of Titus, tells us, speaks about the washing of regeneration through the word. And we have the unbroken tradition of the Christian faith, not just the Catholic Church, the Catholics, the Orthodox, the Armenians, the Coptics, you name it, every Christian church that dates to the earliest century is held forth for the doctrine of baptismal regeneration and the baptism of infants, which is why the Reformers, Luther, Calvin, and so forth, didn't dare to reject a tradition that was so universally attested, and why those that practiced believers' baptism, Anabaptists and then Baptists of the 17th century, were uh, uh, looked askance. They, they really were a sect apart from the historic Christian tradition. Uh, Tom, is that helpful for you? Yes, it is. The, but the only problem is this. I have known people, I knew a man that lived an awful life. He died, I went to his his uh, funeral, uh -huh. and the priest said that because he had been baptized as a baby, brought by his arm, loving arms of his parents, he's in heaven. Okay, well that's not no, the that's, Catholic that's, faith. That's, 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 not, that's not the Catholic faith. That's not the Catholic faith. The Catholic faith does not teach that merely by virtue of your baptism that you are automatically saved and guaranteed a place in heaven. That is not the teaching of the Catholic Church. Baptism initiates us into the life of grace. It makes us members of the body of Christ. But we have the obligation to remain in step with the Spirit. That's what St. Paul tells us in Galatians 5. If the fruit of the Spirit be manifested in our life and we die in that grace, in that friendship with God, only then are we saved. Thank you so much for your call, Tom. Sorry we couldn't get to Clifton, Mike, or LMA. We'll hopefully get them on a future show. David, thank you so much. Hey, thank you, Tom. I appreciate it. My thanks to Rich and uh, also Magic Matt. We'll see you tomorrow. God bless.